Network. This is our 32nd monthly webinar. We've been doing this for almost three years now, uh, every month. And uh, you can find recordings of all of our uh, previous webinars on our website, and I'll post that link there uh, before too long. Um, give you a heads up about our upcoming webinars before I introduce our presenter, Bruce Gagnon. And uh, so we have one in August set up and one in September and one in October. The one in August is on the 15th and I'll send this out in a follow-up email. You can get it in writing from me. Uh, just to let you know, that one in August 15th is about the border industrial complex. And we've had Todd Miller on from the Border Chronicle before and he's gonna be with his uh, fellow Border Chronicler, uh, Melissa Del Bosque. Uh, if you don't know about them, they are these great journalists down in Tucson who are covering what's going on with the, the migrant uh, issue, people coming in and, and with the militarization of the border. Um, so this is a really timely thing with both Republicans and Democrats beating up on the immigrants right now, uh, election year stuff. Uh, in September, on the 17th, we're going to have Bill Hartung, had him before too. He's going to talk about how war corporations are making profits in Gaza and elsewhere, of course. And in October, on the 10th, we're going to have David Swanson. They, uh, World Beyond War will have just completed its annual meeting, and the focus of that is on the U.S. military base empire. So he's going to be talking about the eight to 900 military bases around the world. So stick with us. Those are our upcoming webinars. And now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, my friend, Bruce Gagnon. Uh, so many of you will know Bruce and maybe even really why you're here because it's Bruce. He's been an organizer and activist since 1982 and he co-founded the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in space in 1992. Still coordinate, coordinates it. He's spoken around the world, published many articles, and he blogs really daily at Organizing Notes. Um, and I'm going to say something on a personal note about Bruce, just because I know him pretty well, his friend. Uh, I got to know him when I lived in Maine over 10 years ago now, and I've been friends with him ever since. And I just want to tell you, if you don't know already, that he is not only a truly great organizer, but he is also a great thinker and really a fearless truth teller and a committed leader. Uh, he works every day, and I can testify to that. I've seen him in action to stay informed and to communicate with his really wide audience. Bruce knows a lot, and he has a huge heart. And I'm thankful to have him here on Warren with us tonight. So thanks, Bruce, for being with us, and over to you, brother. Thank you, Ken. I should tell a story about how we first met. During the Iraq War, there was a protest in Portland, Maine, and I looked over there and there was this guy standing there and he had the same exact handmade sign, same words on it that mine had. And so that's how we met and we've been friends ever since. So thank you for having me. Thank you all for being here tonight. I'm gonna to talk to you about NATO and let me bring that up and we'll get started. I made a mistake there. Let me try it again. There we go. Can you see it? Hello? We don't see it, Bruce. You don't you, you don't see it? I don't. Are you sharing Let's your screen? Give it one more shot. Work them in the Spare with us, folks. I thought I was. Oh, I hate doing this. Here comes your technical assistant. Did I help? There you go. 
Looks good. There we go. All right. This is what happens when you get old, I'm telling you that. Okay, here we go. So NATO, they just had their birthday celebration in Washington. Uh, many of us went there to protest against it. And they're having a changing of the guard there. Uh, Stoltenberg on the left, uh, he's retiring from the position of general secretary. And uh, Mark Rutte, who's... Uh, the Prime Minister of Netherlands is taking over as a man with a very bad reputation, ruthless, nasty human being. And here on the right is a picture where he says, what can we say to make it look like Israel hasn't committed any war crimes? That was a leaked audio that he had uh, expressed this in. So NATO is uh, in bad hands. Let's put it that way. I'm going to talk first about Operation Paperclip, and I learned about it by reading this book, Secret Agenda, many years ago. Uh, I read it with the intention of learning more about the Nazis that created the U.S. space program. But while I was at it, I learned uh, a lot about the larger picture of the Nazis that were brought to the United States. More than 1,500 of them at the end of World War II smuggled uh, by the U.S. military into the U.S., about a hundred and some uh, Nazi rocket scientists and engineers were brought ultimately to Huntsville, Alabama, to create the U.S. space program, led by Werner von Braun, the man in the top there in the suit, along with the Nazi officers. Uh, but anyway, I highly recommend this book as an introduction to this issue of Operation Paperclip. But along with von Braun came a whole host of other Nazi operatives that were installed throughout the US military industrial complex. Uh, even the people that were doing the MK Ultra uh, LSD mind control experiments were former Nazi scientists that were brought to the US during this time. The guy on the right, Major General Reinhard Galand, he was Hitler's top intelligence man for Eastern Europe during World War II. His job was to uh, pull together what they called rat lines of uh, Nazis throughout Eastern Europe that during World War II were used to uh, help kill the Russians uh, and, uh, and anyone else that was on the side of the Russians or the Soviet Union at the time. After the war, Galen uh, told the U.S. when they captured him that uh, he thought he could help them. And he told them about his rat lines and he had hidden underground all the names and all the contact information throughout Eastern Europe. And so they brought Galen to the United States and they put him through a few tests to make sure that they could trust him. And they put him in charge of uh, reenacting or re-enlivening uh, enlivening this rat line throughout Eastern Europe to immediately begin essentially uh, undercover war against the former Soviet Union. One of the reasons that, uh, as it turns out, that Stalin was so crazy and finding, you know, people all the time that he didn't trust and everything else was because he was just freaking out about all these Nazis that were throughout Eastern Europe now inside countries that became part of the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc, uh, many of them were Nazis. And so finally Galen uh, was sent back to Germany. Uh, now there's, after the war, there's East and West Germany, of course. West Germany was the so-called democratic side and East Germany was the Soviet side. And Galen was put in charge of the West German, the so-called Democratic side's version of the CIA. So after the war, you have a former Nazi intelligence killer uh, put in charge of the CIA in the so-called Free West Germany. So this is how the Nazis, essentially, many of the Nazis uh, escaped any kind of persecution after the war and essentially just switch sides 
and continued doing their anti-communist work that they were doing before. On the left are just eight of these former Nazis. And the bottom line on each of these descriptions tells how long they worked for NATO. Some of them into the late 70s and early 80s working uh, for NATO uh, uh, throughout Europe. So this is really something that very few people know about, but we should all uh, make sure that people know more about it. They also set up an operation they called Gladio. Gladio was the hidden network of Nazis throughout Europe. And their job was to ensure that no country would go communist. For example, in Italy and Greece and some other European countries, the communist parties were very strong after the war, after World War II. And, and, and it looked like they were gonna win elections. And so Gladio was sent in to do assassinations and uh, uh, terrorist activities and other things, which they blamed on the communists and uh, in order to uh, uh, create bad uh, feelings of the public towards the communists. You know, oh my God, look at the terrorism the communists are doing. But as it turned out, it was uh, Gladio, uh, which really, if, if I think the, the thing on here, the Pentagon Nazis mafia, I've come to believe that the mafia and the Nazis and the Pentagon are all linked. And this book really goes to, uh, to, in, into great detail about making that case. Very important book. Another crucial book, I think, about this whole period of time and the rise of this CIA and uh, with the Nazis uh, as part of it uh, is this book by David Talbot, The Devil's Chessboard, Alan Dulles, The CIA and the Rise of America's Secret Government. I would say this is one of the top three or four books I've read during my entire life. A hugely important book. I hope everybody will read it. It will change your life and it will change the way you think about all of these things that are going on today. And he, again, it, it reads like a mystery story. He's a great writer and a great storyteller. And it's just a fascinating, incredibly uh, fascinating book. So NATO then, off to a running start then after World War II. And one of their first operations in terms of making war was the Yugoslavia War in 1999. And the consequences of that over the years have been tremendous in terms of the use of depleted uranium by, the, uh, by NATO. I'll, I'll never forget a story I read in Aviation Week and Space Technology right after the war was over uh, against Yugoslavia. It was, they said the first time that cyber war was ever used by the U.S. in act, actual uh, military operation. And what the U.S. did was they had their cyber people essentially crawl inside of Yugoslavia's air defense system computers shut down their entire air defense system so that when US and NATO planes were bombing Belgrade, um, they blew up the Chinese embassy, you might remember. Oh, sorry, we, we used an old map, they said. But anyway, Yugoslavia was not able to uh, use their air defense system to protect themselves against a NATO attack. They were totally defenseless, the first use of cyber warfare. And the map on the right shows where the US and NATO have nuclear weapons today stored. And in, uh, in England, they're going back into Lake and Heath, uh, England. Uh, they had been uh, pushed out of there by the peace movement years ago, but now they're going back in there. They're in the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Italy, and also in Turkey. So, and now they're upgrading all of those nuclear weapons, the US, these are US nuclear weapons. They're upgrading them with new generations of capability. Well, one of the 
first things Bill Clinton did when he became president, you might notice a few of the people there in this picture on the left. One of the first things he did was to uh, begin what he called NATO enlargement, which uh, I call NATO expansion on steroids. Remember, at the time of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev was asked by the US and NATO if he would support the reunification of Germany, East and West. And Gorbachev said he would on one condition, that NATO not ever expand one inch towards Russia. And so it was agreed that NATO would not expand. But when Clinton became president, he began this NATO expansion. On the right is a book written by a journalist from Norway, a friend of mine, Bard Warmdahl, called Stalking the Bear, The Unknown History of CIA and NSA in Norway. So in these early days, again, after the war, the US was essentially surrounding Russia with space technology capability in order to spy on them and to also have targeting capability against, against Russia. And so as NATO began to expand, these technology systems were moving closer and closer and closer towards Russia inside of these NATO countries. Now let's go to 1991, back to the time of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. There was going to be an election and Boris Yeltsin was running for uh, re-election. And it looked like he was going to lose to the Communist Party in Russia. All the polls were showing that he was going to lose. Well, Clinton sent in his favorite campaign operative. You might remember the name Dick Morris. He was Clinton's key campaign operative. And they sent him in to essentially rescue this American operation, you know, uh, the U.S. loves to talk about uh, Russian interference in our elections, but if there was ever a case of interference in an election, it was in 1991. And so Clinton had Morris not only raise all kinds of money that went into Yeltsin's campaign, but they used the media all over the world, the Western media and the Russian media, in order to push Yeltsin to victory, and he indeed did win the election. Well, when he retired, the alcoholic that he was, he finally retired. And Vladimir Putin was, he selected Vladimir Putin to come in uh, and take his place. And in 19, uh, was it, uh, I believe, yeah, 2007 rather, 2007, Vladimir Putin spoke at the Munich Security Conference. It's an annual conference on uh, international uh, foreign policy. And he, quote, accused the U.S. of creating a unipolar world in which there is one master, one sovereign, meaning the United States. And he added, at the end of the day, this is pernicious. Well, this infuriated the United States. And if you look in the front row, right in front of the podium, you might recognize three faces. On the left is Robert Gates, then I believe Secretary of Defense. Next to him is John McCain. And then next to him is Senator Joe Lieberman. And uh, the US was so furious with uh, Putin for daring to stand up and daring to talk about national sovereignty that the UN charter says every nation should have the right to be free of intervention and interference by other nations. And he had the temerity to stand up and call out the US in front of the world. And after that, he has been on, he, uh, Putin and Russia has been on the US and the West's shit list ever since. In 2019, the Rand Corporation, remember they famously uh, did the uh, 
book that Daniel Ellsberg worked on and uh, got to the media during the Vietnam War, the Pentagon Papers. The Rand Corporation created this study in 2019 called Overextending and Unbalancing Russia, essentially creating the strategy. Don't forget, Rand is mostly funded by the Pentagon. It's a Pentagon think tank. Their job is to create plans for the Pentagon. And so uh, this plan really goes out of its way to lay down the strategy, the do's and don'ts of taking Russia apart. This on the right, this uh, foreign policy magazine, it's, it's really the mouthpiece of the deep state in Washington. And in this uh, article, Washington must prepare for war with both Russia and China. And so clearly for a long time, uh, the US has been planning to go to war with Russia and China and to break Russia up into smaller countries. On the right is a map that uh, is circulating amongst the West that where they uh, have come up with their plan to break Russia up into smaller countries. Now imagine if Russia or China was to come out with a map of calling for the breaking up of the United States into X, Y, Z pieces. Why, we, uh, the United States would go ballistic if we were to do such a thing. One of the women that's uh, behind this is, her name is Kaj Kaja Kallas, and she's from uh, Estonia. She's the prime minister there. She's just been named the new pol uh, foreign policy uh, director for the European Parliament. And in this article, she talks about it wouldn't be a bad thing for Russia, such a big country, to be broken up into smaller pieces. And so this is literally the out front, out front, spoken in front of the whole world strategy now of the U.S. and NATO and the European Union. So for many years now, since this NATO enlargement of Clinton's has started, every year the U.S. and NATO hold war games, inching closer and closer and closer to Russia. And then again, I ask, how is Russia expected to react? How do we expect they will feel? Imagine if Russia and China were holding war games in Mexico and Canada, the U.S. would go ballistic. So they hold them in the, in, the, in the European area, Eastern Europe area, and then on the right is the picture where they're holding war games up in the Nordic region as well. Sweden, for example, uh, since they joined NATO, the door has opened for U.S. bases to move into NATO the U.S. had uh, been active already in Sweden. Uh, number one, Karuna, the very one in the top of the north. Uh, the Global Network had a meeting there some years ago. It's a big space downlink facility that the U.S. and NATO used to spy on Russia, intercept all their phone and fax and email communications. But now, throughout the entire country, the U.S. is planning these bases in Sweden. So Finland and Sweden have recently joined NATO. And again, Russia is saying, my God, you people, <laughs> uh, are you ever going to stop? Are you going to keep coming until you're banging on our door? You're banging on our door now with Ukraine. You want to make Ukraine part of NATO. You want to put missiles. You want to put nuclear missiles in Ukraine. The U.S. does. NATO does. Isn't it? You know, when does this stop? This picture on the top left is from Poland, where the United States has built a so-called missile defense launch facility in Poland. And they've built a similar one in Romania. And what these bases can do is they can do two things. Number one, they can launch first strike Tomahawk cruise missiles, which can carry nuclear warheads 
They can fire them from these this base in Poland and one in Romania. They will reach Moscow in a matter of minutes from these locations. It's a Cuban missile crisis in reverse, but the American people know nothing about it. Then with a the turn of a switch, they can also launch, because they expect that after you launch these cruise missiles, after a US first strike attack on Russia, Russia's gonna fire retaliatory strike. So they want their so-called missile defense system, the shield, to be used after the US first strike sword plunges into the heart of Russia. So with just a turn of a switch then, when Russia fires their retaliatory capability, this, these bases in Romania and Poland can fire missile defense interceptors to theoretically pick off Russian retaliatory strike. On the bottom right, is another base in Poland. It's called a weapons hub. When after every time there's a US war game, US NATO war game in Eastern Europe, US ships over all kinds of hardware on Navy, uh, big Navy freighters. And then when it's over, they leave it there. And they put it in this hub here in Poland for eventual use. Picture on the right is Norway, another one of these US NATO war games. And they have a weapons hub there in Norway as well. And so after the war games in the Nordic region, the US leaves the equipment there and then it's stored for later use. Now on the left is a US Navy planning document, interesting date, 2014. 2014 date comes up quite often. Remember, that was the date of the U.S. orchestrated coup d'etat in Kiev that installed the Nazi-backed regime that has been in power ever since that time. So in that year of 2014, the U.S. Navy did a study about taking control of the Arctic for Western resource extraction corporations to benefit them. A few years ago, Thomas Friedman, columnist for the New York Times, went on a submarine, US nuclear submarine ride underneath the Arctic ice. And along for the ride was US Senator Angus King from the state of Maine and other luminaries, including the uh, chief of staff at that time of, of the Navy. And in Thomas Friedman's article, the chief of staff of the Navy said, we have to make sure that our weapons work in the Arctic region so that we can own the Arctic region in the years to come. Well, what country has the largest border with the Arctic? Well, as this map on the left shows, it's Russia. And because of climate change, and the melting of the Arctic ice, the Western Resource Extraction Corporations want to drill baby drill up in that region. But they can't right now because Russia has the largest border. Another reason why they want to break Russia up into these smaller countries, which would make it easier for these Western Resource Extraction Corporations to control the Arctic region to do the uh, mining of the sea, and also to steal the other vast resources that Russia has throughout their country. Now on the right is another one of these US NATO war games. But this one is particularly interesting to me because it happened in another one of these important dates. You might remember the date of February of 2022. Remember, that's when Russia supposedly unprovoked invaded Ukraine. That's what we hear all the time. Unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Well, as it turned out, that about two weeks before Russians, Russia's special military operation that went into Ukraine, NATO held this war game called Response right on 
the Norway-Russia border. Now, if you look at the map, look down near the bottom, you see Finland, the green, Sweden, reddish color, and Norway, a bluish color. And look at how Norway has a jog leg at the top. It, Norway turns to the right. Tromso, big Navy base there that the US is now using to put its naval warships. And then just beyond that, Norway actually touches the border of Russia. And that's where they held cold response war game. Two weeks before the special military operation began. So clearly, Russia sees the writing on the wall, they know what's going on, and they're reacting to it. This picture on the right, this graphic on the right, just gives some sense of the kind of resources available, oil and gas, in that region, uh, the Russian region. And the media are on the left, this article predicting the conflict with Russia. Now I wanna to go to May 2nd, 2014. Remember, I mentioned that the coup d'etat orchestrated by the US in Ukraine in 2014, done by the Obama administration. Joe Biden was in charge of it overall. Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, played a key role, and her assistant, Secretary of State Victoria Nuland, was the person on the ground, hands-on, running the operation to make the coup possible. Well, one of the first things that was done after the coup happened was the newly installed government, again backed by the strength and power of the Nazis, was to declare the speaking of Russian and Ukraine illegal. Imagine that. And so people in uh, Russia, I mean, excuse me, in, in Ukraine, in what they call the Donbass region, the far eastern side of Ukraine, bordering Russia, Russian ethnic all the way, they began holding peaceful protests and signature gathering uh, campaigns to say, we want a federated Ukraine. You know, they were often called Russian separatists, but they weren't. They were saying, we want a federated Ukraine. We want local autonomy in the Russian speaking parts of Ukraine so that we can continue to speak our own language, so that we can elect our own local officials rather than have this new uh, right wing government that the US installed in Kiev have them appoint the the uh, you know the governor you know and the and the uh, parliamentary people in the uh, eastern part of Ukraine, and in the city of Odessa, where this picture comes from, on May second, twenty fourteen, outside of this trades union hall that is pictured on the right, people were in what we call tabling in the United States. They were gathering signatures because there's a big park in front of this building where lots of people walk by. And they were gathering signatures for a referendum, national referendum, saying we want a federated Ukraine. And they were attacked by the Nazis who came in with Molotov cocktails, started a fire. The, there was about a hundred and some people outside in big tents that they had set up uh, that they were gathering signatures. They ran inside the building. And so, uh, the fire starts and soon smoke was billowing into the building and people, you see it on the right, on the second floor there, they start coming outside because they couldn't breathe and they came out. And when they came out, there were people on the ground. I was watching this literally real time. It was on YouTube videos, real time. And people were on the ground shooting at them, these Nazis with their Ukrainian flags and their schwatstikas and they, you see people with helmets. They had batons or bats. Uh, some people jumped from the building to escape the fire and the smoke. And when they hit the ground, they were beaten to death by the Nazis. They blocked the fire department from coming to put out the fire. And more than 50 were killed. Their bodies were found. But more than 100 disappeared. Nobody ever knew what happened to them. And nobody was ever prosecuted, even though there was voluminous 
photographic and video evidence of who was committing these crimes, uh, no one ever was prosecuted. In fact, the only people that went to jail were some of the survivors that crawled out of this building and they were thrown in jail. To this day, they've never, never, no one has been prosecuted. Well, here's a map of Ukraine and look again on the right side, the Donbass region, it's the red part. At the top, Lugansk, Donetsk, Mariupol, Crimea. These are all the Russian ethnic, pure Russian ethnic parts of Russia. This is where the people were gathering signatures, having the peaceful marches, and that was not allowed. And so this picture on the right, this uh, shows how uh, in 2022, at the time of the special military operation that Russia launched, uh, Ukraine, with U.S. NATO help, had uh, amassed a total of 150,000 troops right in that region of the Donbass. And they were getting ready. Russian uh, uh, intelligence was picking up that these people were going to do a major ultimate invasion of the Donbass to finish off the people. They had already killed at that point more than 14,000, wounded more than 34,000 people in their long time attacks. On the right is a picture of the Nazis being sent from the Western Ukraine. Let's just go back for a moment. If you look at the map, Western Ukraine in the blue over by Poland, that is where the Nazis originate. During World War II, when Hitler swept through Poland to invade the Soviet Union, there was a man by the name of Stefan Bandera. He, he was a Nazi sympathizer. He was a nationalist Ukrainian. And he put on a Nazi uniform and gathered his people to join Hitler in killing Poles by the tens of thousands, Jews by the tens of thousands, uh, Russian ethnics, and others. And so that is where the Nazis still today predominate. So what happened was, after the coup in 2014, the U.S. set up a military, U.S. and NATO, a military training base in western Ukraine. I know this because one of my friends, he, he had a son in the U.S. Army Special Forces stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado. And his son was sent there two times to be one of the trainers of these Nazis. Well, this picture on the left is this training base in Western Ukraine. You might recognize some of these civilians standing there. On the right in the black jacket is Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina. To his left, John McCain, then Senator from uh, Arizona. To his left, you might know this woman. She ran for president four years ago, uh, Amy Klobacher, Democrat senator from Minnesota. And to her left, Democrat congresswoman uh, Marcy Captur from Ohio. They went there to meet the Nazis who were brought in and to what they called the new National Guard of Ukraine and to encourage them. And there's videos of McCain and, and, uh, and uh, Graham speaking to these people, saying that we're never going to forsake you. We're staying with you. This is the year of offense. We're now going to go and we're going to kick Russia's rear end. And th that's what they did. They started sending these troops over into the Donbass region, into Lugansk, Donetsk, Mariupol, aimed at Crimea. And this is why the people of Crimea, when they saw all this happening, they quickly held a referendum and voted by 97% to say, we want to go back to Russia. We've always been part of Russia since Catherine the Great. We want to go back to Russia. Well, in 2019, I went there myself. I wanted to pick the forbidden fruit. So I went to the Donbass. I went to Lugansk and Donetsk. And when I entered Donetsk, a big, big city, the picture on the top left, as we entered the city, we're in the downtown city now, 
And there are these buildings that had been shelled by the Nazis since 2014. Nobody was living in them anymore because the Nazis had been shelling them with U.S. weapons, U.S. training, U.S. support, U.S. satellite guidance uh, for their uh, technology and everything else. And then I went to Lugansk and they took me to a bridge and the middle of the bridge had been blown up. That's the picture on the right. And so this rickety old wooden stairway was created to go down one side of the blown up bridge across uh, to the other side and up the other side. And what I learned was it's senior citizens that are going to collect their pension in the next city. They had worked in the coal mines in Ukraine in the Donbass region for their whole life. And now they're retired. And the only way to get their pensions, they had to go into back into uh, the other part of Ukraine outside of the Donbass region uh, that uh, that had become a sort of independent uh, and sovereign during this period. And so they had to climb up and down this. I saw people in wheelchairs, people with walkers, people with crutches trying to navigate this whole thing. This is what the uh, what the Ukrainian government thought of their own citizens, and they did this just because they were Russian ethnic people. I came away not at all confused by Western media anymore. It was completely and totally always demonizing the people of the Donbass as Russian separatists. Well, when... Russia went into Ukraine in 2022, essentially to push out these Nazis who had been there since 2014 and had been killing the people in the Donbass. And I talked to some of my friends in the peace movement, frankly, and they said to me, Bruce, I understand, you know, that, the, you know, these Nazis have been there and, you know, killing these people in the Donbass. But why didn't Putin do, you know, negotiations? Why didn't he negotiate, you know, instead of just going in with the military? And I said, what do you think they've been doing all these years? The Minsk agreements were essentially initiated by Vladimir Putin. They met in Minsk in Belarus. The government of Ukraine came to the negotiations, as did uh, President Hollande of France and Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany. And they all together negotiated an agreement to make the Donbass a federated part of Ukraine. Russia wasn't insisting in these negotiations that they were going to control Ukraine, uh, this part of Ukraine. Russia was happy to say, just let it be federated. Just stop killing these Russian ethnics. Let them have local autonomy. Let them speak their language. But no. 2014, they negotiated Minsk I. 2015, they negotiated Minsk II. And guess what happened? Well, about a year and a half ago, we heard from former President Hollande of France, Angela Merkel of Germany, and Petro Poroshenko, the previous president before Zelensky of Ukraine, they all said the same thing. In Western media, it was reported that we only agreed to the Minsk agreements in order to buy time to build up Ukrainian military in the Donbass region so we could finish them off. That is what they did. And Putin, when he heard these people come out and make that statement, he said to the Russian people, they played us for fools. They tricked us. They led us to believe that they were serious about these agreements for a federated Ukraine. And we got played one more time. And so you got to ask, what's driving all this stuff? One of the things that's driving it is a picture on the right is big corporations like Monsanto want to get in there and farm that rich 
Ukrainian soil. They always said Ukraine was the breadbasket of Europe. And, uh, but they wanted to plant GMOs. Russia doesn't allow GMOs in their country. And, uh, but they want to plant GMOs in Ukraine. <clears throat> this is just one of many reasons why the Western corporations want to take control of Ukraine. You might have heard recently about two attacks into Russia. The one on the top is a Russian early warning, nuclear warning uh, station that was hit by drones supplied by Western countries armed with bombs. This tower is, is a uh, early warning station. That tower was hit by one of these drones. Uh, the drones were directed by US military uh, space technology. Uh, Ukraine doesn't have those capabilities to fly drones to their targets. They need someone to give them the coordinates and to give them the, all the specs to make that possible. Uh, and that is what the US has been doing as these uh, Western weapons are now hitting inside of Russia. Now, why do they want to hit early morning radar? This is the way Russia can see if the United States launches a first strike nuclear attack on Russia. Now they're in this position where, holy shit, we, we get the slightest uh, feeling that we're under attack. We got to launch our nuclear weapons in retaliation. Otherwise, they're going to be taken out. And this, this bottom picture, this was very recently, uh, cluster bombs launched uh, from Ukraine, again, on uh, weapons supplied by the U.S. and NATO, directed to their targets by U.S. satellite technology. Uh, cluster bombs made by the United States and donated by the United States to Ukraine landed on a beach in Crimea, Sevastopol, uh, in Crimea killing uh, men, women, and children, injuring many. So Russia is feeling the pressure right now, I promise you. Remember I told you about where Norway touches the border of Russia? Well, there's a place called Vardo, little village. That's this place here where this Globus 3 U.S. Uh, 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 radar station is located that is able to help direct a U.S. first strike attack on Russia. So not only is the United States now encouraging Ukraine to try to take out Russian early warning uh, stations, but the U.S. is also using these of its own right on Russia's border to help direct these attacks against Russia. It's just uh, been announced in recent days that the United States will be deploying uh, nuclear missiles, long range, me rather uh, medium range nuclear missiles into uh, Germany aimed at Russia. Uh, back in 1983, I lived in Orlando, Florida, and I used to lead protests outside of a place called Martin Marietta, later uh, became uh, Lockheed Martin. They were building the Pershing II nuclear missile, intermediate range nuclear missile. And at the same time, the U.S. was deploying that missile in Germany. The U.S. was deploying Tomahawk cruise missiles, the kind that I said can now be fired from that, those facilities in Poland and Romania. Uh, the U.S. was deploying cruise missiles, nuclear tipped in England, Italy, and uh, I forgot where else in Europe, another country as well. A treaty a few years later, after 83, after they were all deployed, a treaty uh, took those missiles out. Both sides uh, had missiles in Europe uh, aimed at each other and the Soviet Union and uh, 
of the United States. And so a treaty took all those missiles out. Uh, the United States, during the Trump administration, uh, walked away from that treaty, pulled out of that treaty. And now the United States is reintroducing these intermediate range nuclear missiles into Germany, which of course Moscow is very worried about. At the same time, the United States is saying that the, they and their NATO partners will be sending F-16s to Ukraine. They're now training F-16 pilots. They're gonna supply the, the, the planes, the weapons on the planes, the guys to fix the planes because Ukraine doesn't have the guys that know how to fix the planes. And even though they say they're training the pilots, experts are saying that it takes a couple of years to train F-16 pilots. And many people believe that NATO troops will be flying these F-16 pilots in Ukraine, flying missions uh, against Russia, firing missiles into Russia, et cetera, et cetera. We're told that Russia wants to take over Europe, it wants to invade Europe. After Ukraine, it wants to move on and take control of Europe. Well, Russia spends about 5% of the world populate, of the, of the world spending on, on the military. But Russia spends about 5%. When you add up NATO members and partners, it comes to virtually 70% of the world total and Russia's spending about 5%. Russia is not a threat to Europe, and they know it in NATO, but they're using the fear that they're creating throughout Europe and throughout the United States, throughout the West, in order to get NATO to spend more money on the military. And when they spend that money on the military, they have to buy from the United States because the rule at NATO is all weapon systems have to be interoperable with the United States systems. Everything flows through the US space technology warfare system. And so all the weapons of NATO have to be able to be interoperable with the US space technology system. And the US then remains in charge of the tip of the spear. So this whole thing is a massive boondoggle for the military industrial complex. At the same time, China, we're told, is an enemy. China wants to take over the world. China wants to take over Taiwan. China wants to invade all kinds of places. This book on the left, I highly recommend it. The China Mirage blew my mind. Again, one of the top five books of my life that I ever read. Two short stories from this book. One is, if you don't know about the opium wars, please search and learn about them. The Opium Wars, the British and the United States uh, were largely involved in the opium uh, production. It was done in India, transported to China. The people of China were made to be addicted to opium. The country was being destroyed and Britain and the US were taking over the country. The uh, two of our most famous Democrats in America, FDR, and John Kerry, their relatives before them were some of the largest opium dealers that brought opium uh, into, into China. And they made huge money, huge profit off it. They called it in America, the China trade. And the American people didn't know what they were trading in. Nobody said, you know, in, in the New York Times and all the other media, you know, at the time, they didn't tell everybody that these leading Americans from the East Coast of the United States were drug dealers. And what we learned in this, what I learned in this book is that Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Princeton were all built with opium trade money. And the first inter intercontinental railroad across the United States was built with opium trade money. The U.S. has a long, sordid history in these criminal activities, mobster-like, mafia-like activities. And some of our leading institutions in this country were built and enshrined with this money from this stuff. 
Now, the people of China know this story very well. The American people don't know anything about it. And so today, the U.S. in this pivot, as Hillary Clinton called it during the Obama administration, the pivot of U.S. military forces into the Asia Pacific to defend, defend the Asia Pacific against this uh, China that wants to create a new empire. When the U.S. is now expanding military operations throughout the region in Australia, in Guam, Philippines, Japan, South Korea, Okinawa, all over the place, the U.S. is building barracks, ports of call, new airfields for its war machine, all to go to war. A global war machine NATO is becoming for global World War III. Remember that earlier foreign policy article I showed you coming out of the Deep State Council on Foreign Relations? We have to plan, we have to prepare for war with Russia and China. And AUKUS, the one on the right, AUKUS stands for Australia, the United Kingdom, and the US. It's a submarine program, nuclear submarines aimed at China. So massive military activity in the region. This, this slide on the left blew my mind. I just found this a few weeks ago. Kinman Island, the top uh, red dot there near Quanzhou, is Kinman Island is three kilometers from China's border. Three kilometers. And the United States has set up a base there and also in the Pengu Islands, further out, uh, sort of halfway between Taiwan and China coast. But this is how aggressive the United States is getting today. And again, how do, how do we expect China to respond to this? I mean, let's, let's be serious. And so NATO is now saying that they're building a headquarters, an Asia Pacific headquarters, an office inside of Japan. And so Japan is becoming one of the key instruments in this warfare against, against China. And it's interesting because don't forget that during World War II, Japan was a fascist country. And after the war was over, the US protected the fascists in Japan, just the way they did with the Nazis in Germany, brought them into the new government in Japan and populated it with many of the fascists that run, ran Imperial Japan. The United States has this down to an art form. Well, NATO must be opposed. I think you might notice the guy on the right in that picture there, our, our dear friend, Ken Jones, and his wife, Melody. We were all in uh, Washington, D.C. two weeks ago, you know, protesting against NATO. I was proud to be there. 75 years of deception NATO has done, warfare, terrorism. There's no other word to describe NATO but a terrorist organization. This picture on the right is a friend of mine from, from Maine. She's a great artist. She made this banner. Remember, a nuclear war is a terminal war. We're done. Finished, says Noam Chomsky. Thank you all for listening. Okay. Oof. Thank you, Bruce. That's a lot of information. Somebody posted in the chat. That's a lot of information that you'll never see on mainstream media. And it's true. Thank you for sharing all that. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to have Q&A. Uh, but before we do, uh, as is our custom with Warren, we're going to do a little online action. And Brian Garvey is going to lead us through that. So over to you, Brian. Thank you very much, Ken. And thank you, Bruce, for that fantastic presentation. I'll ask you right now, because I know we're going to get uh, this question from the audience. Uh, will you make your slides available uh, to us? Of course. Fantastic. So that'll go out in the, in the follow-up along with the recording. Yeah. Uh, and I want to thank you for all of the recommendations as well. Um, I just downloaded the channel 
Ice from the public library, and I'm looking forward to reading it. But as Ken uh, alluded to, uh, here at Mass Peace Action and the War Industry Resistors Network, uh, we always like to use community education to spur on public advocacy. So we're going to do that right now. As Bruce was telling us, one of the most dangerous things that NATO is doing right now is continuing to extend the invitation and promise of NATO membership to Ukraine, despite the fact that Ukraine is actively at war with Russia. So if you oppose that, because of the danger that it poses to Ukrainian citizens as well as citizens of NATO countries. You can click the link that I just put in the chat and very easily, in just about 30 seconds, you can send a simple message to your member of the House of Representatives and your two senators, if you are here with us in the United States, and let them know that you oppose uh, the expansion of NATO on steroids that Bruce was referring to. Uh, we have already seen a couple of countries added to NATO during the war in Ukraine. We do not need any more. Uh, these are further provocations and could be excuses for further wars. And we do not need that in the 21st century. So please take 30 seconds, click on that action. I'll put it in the chat one more time. And you can very easily send a simple message uh, to your members of Congress saying that you oppose NATO expansion and that you endorse peace negotiations and ceasefire to end the war. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Doesn't even take 30 seconds. You click on that thing and away you go. So very slick. Thanks, Brian, for setting that up. And uh, so now we have a little time. We're going to give ourselves 15 or 20 minutes to do a Q&A with Bruce. And uh, the way we will do it is if you see the reaction button on your, um, on my, in my uh, interface, it's down the bottom of my screen. It has a, a hand raising button you can click. And uh, what we'll do is uh, ask you to raise your hand by means of clicking on that button in the reaction area and uh, we'll get you to ask the question. And um, I will ask you to make your comment brief if you have a comment, and please do have a question so we can have Bruce uh, speak to us some more. Um, let's see here, I'm looking for people who may be lined up with their... We do have Donald Smith. Okay, good, Donald, then go right ahead. Okay, so Bruce, I loved your presentation. I agree with 99% of what you said, but I, I think there was a factual error in one thing you said. You said that uh, the uh, po post-2014 Ukrainian government pro uh, made it illegal to speak Russian. From what I've read, it, it made the official use of Russian, like in government affairs and education, illegal, but you know you can still speak it in your home. So I said, I like... 99% of what you said, but I, I believe that was, uh, wasn't was quite correct. Well, that's, uh, that's not what I heard from the people there in the Donbass when I visited there. That's not what they told me. And they were living there, of course. They were experiencing all of this in real time. So uh, uh, anyway, I, I, I'll take the word of those people. But thank you for your comment, though. Okay, uh, let's see, I see a question. There's Paul Shan with a question. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Bruce, I was just quickly, I wonder if you could say what the source of that map was, the map of uh, Russia divided up into different countries or different areas. Um, whose plan was that? And what, where does that map come from? Uh, I don't know, to be honest with you. I've seen two different maps. Uh, and they're very similar, um, but they're coming out of Western sources. I know that, but who, who actually did them, I, I don't know. Uh, it's it, I, I've seen it in many different places, and that's how I captured it and saved it, uh, but I don't know who exactly made it. But the fact is that the Estonian prime minister 
Uh, that's the reason why I put the map right next to her picture and that article about her where she's talking about breaking Russia up. So clearly, if they're going to uh, uh, develop a plan to break Russia up into pieces, they must have some ideas about how they want to do that. And so I think it makes sense that they would develop some maps in order to <clears throat> begin to uh, carry out that program. Don't forget, this is exactly what they did to Yugoslavia. They broke the communist country up uh, of Yugoslavia into pieces. And in Kosovo, they built Camp Bonsteel, the biggest base in Europe, I believe it is. Uh, so uh, this was, uh, it gave them, it gave NATO, US and NATO, a military base right in the heart of what used to be this communist uh, country of Yugoslavia. And so I think it's the same kind of plan, you know. Well, it's just I would like to be able to use that that map. It would be great if, if you do find out. Uh, I think if you just if you, if you just went online and searched, you know, uh, map, you'd probably find uh, I didn't really do a lot of searching to find its source. How What is your sense of how official that policy of dividing Russia up was in the U.S. government. Well, if you think about it, just, oh, we hear it all the time. Uh, we've heard it from Biden in the last uh, six months. We've heard him say repeatedly, him and others. I've, I've heard it from many politicians from both parties that we need to break Russia up. We need to do regime change, get rid of Putin, and then break Russia up into smaller countries. I've, I've heard it repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Bruce, I want to pop a question in here before I get to a couple other people raising their hands. Would you clarify the relationship between the U.S. and NATO, uh, mostly through the, you were referring to NATO, but you also referred to the U.S., but I mean, in some ways they could be conflated, I suppose, but um, tell us the relationship between U.S. and NATO now as it is. Well, I think most critics of NATO say that U.S. runs NATO, U.S. controls NATO. It's, uh, you know, that map I showed of Sweden and all those bases now that are going to go in there since it joined NATO, they've become a colony, literally a colony. You know, United States is a, a colonizer. And so NATO is a, a series of countries that have been colonized by the United States. I'm starting a project. I haven't had much time to work on it yet, but I've been getting a list of all these Eastern European countries, the, the presidents, the prime ministers, etc. I've made a list, but I need to research them because I have a theory that a lot of them went to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Columbia and were brought into the CIA and then were, were then funded by George Soros and USAID and the project, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, other uh, programs the U.S. has, and got them elected inside of these countries. They then joined NATO, and uh, there you go. So I, I've found in a couple of cases, it's already, I'm, I'm correct about that, but I want to do a thorough research on that. So I believe that NATO is a colony, a, a, a massive colony of the United States. And now they want to take that military colony into Asia Pacific, and they want to use it to do the same thing there, to further colonize Philippines, to further colonize South Korea, to further colonize Japan and Guam and, you know, Australia and New Zealand. People in Australia and New Zealand uh, in the peace movement say they can't believe the stuff that is going on in their country now with the United States. And it's not even discussed in, the, in their parliament. I mean, that means they're a colony. They're just taking marching orders. The way, you know, our friends in England, you know, they say that uh, when, uh, you know, there's all these U.S. space warfare bases in Northern England and Yorkshire, and the British military, the British government doesn't know what goes on there because they're a colony and the U.S. runs it and they don't even, they don't even talk to the British about what, what's happening there. It, it, that's just the way it works. Yeah, thanks for that. That's really helpful. 
Okay, I see four more hands up there. Maybe we can call a quiz after we go through four more people here. Uh, Herbert Weiner, go ahead. Let's hear what. Let's hear your question. You're muted, Herbert. Greetings from San Francisco. Uh, some thoughts come to mind. Uh, I think there's a geopolitical aspect of this because what happened uh, is there's this philosophy of controlling the Eurasian landmass. And NATO is one aspect of this. And you'll notice when I refer to the Eurasian landmass, I also refer to China. And so I think basically some geopolitics enter into this. And also Neo NATO harkens back to the concert of Europe under Count Metternich. It's basically a counter-revolutionary organization. And also, we must remember after World War I, the Soviet Union was encircled. After World War II, it was NATO again and doing the encirclement. And now it's further encirclement with NATO. And I think it's throwing a ring around Russia and they're going to respond. Don't be surprised if the missiles break out of this ring of containment. It's basically very provocative and also it causes internal repression within Russia. Yeah, let's give Bruce uh, or, a chance to respond. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. That's great, thanks. Well, thank you very much. It, it, your statement is good, and it reminds me of Zbigniew Brzezinski's book, The Grand Chessboard, another book people should read, where he talks about this very region that you just described and how important it is that whoever controls that part of the world, the Eurasian landmass, will control the globe because it's the gateway between Asia and Europe, right? The middle ground, the middle area, so to speak. And that reminded me, as I thought of that, when I heard you say that, I forgot to mention that Zbigniew Brzezinski, remember he was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor. <clears throat> he was the first uh, director of the trilateral commission that was US, Europe, and Japan that was beginning to create all these uh, strategies during the 1980s, a book by Holly Sklar called Trilateralism. Uh, it was one of, I read that in the early 80s. It was one of the first in inclinations that I had about these developments that were going on. But anyway, Zbigniew Brzezinski's son was the ambassador to Sweden about two ambassadorships ago. It was during the Obama administration. And his job was to prepare the way to get Sweden to agree to come into NATO. So it's interesting to see how the Brzezinski agenda, right, plan uh, translated into his son working in Sweden. Uh, and because I've, I've worked with Sweden a lot, we have a board member there, Agneta Norberg, that's a great activist in Sweden. I, I said we had a conference there years ago in northern Sweden at a U.S. space technology operation there. And she was always talking about Brzezinski and how he was uh, pressuring the media in Sweden to be more uh, anti-Russia, Russia-phobic, and all that kind of thing. And so it worked. Their plan worked. They were able to draw in Sweden, make it a colony, and now the U.S., has a, all these bases there in that country. All right, thank you. And thank you, Herbert, for that question there, Tamara. Uh, let's see, Tamara. Uh, hi, everyone. Bruce, thank you very much for your really important presentation. I hope that everybody will uh, share the recording of the presentation. And I hope that you'll continue to make this um, give this important talk in many other places. I would just like to add a, a couple of quick comments. One is, I see you know, NATO as a way for the United States to socialize and discipline 
allies. You know, they're always singing off the same song song sheet. They get they get the the sheet from Washington, and everybody repeats what Washington has to say. I see this with my own country, with with Canada, and I also really appreciate that Black Alliance for Peace sees NATO as a white supremacist organization. You know, pre pre uh, privileging and preserving white supremacy through violence. And I think that's really important. I want to share a resource um, called uh, NATO in the Balkans, uh, Voices from the Opposition by the International Action Center from 1998 and the other book that they have on Yugoslavia from uh, 2000. And um, NATO you, um, um, has a blueprint for breaking up a country, like you said, in Yugoslavia. But if you read these books about how the United States, went, with Germany especially, went about breaking up the former Yugoslavia, this is the playbook that they want to use for Russia. And this is why it's important for us to understand what happened, this history, and you know, do what we can to peace build with 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 Russia and and stop this war in Ukraine. But my questions are, I'm wondering if you um, have any re reaction to the outcome of the uh, 75th anniversary summit that just took place in Washington, DC and this Washington declaration that I see is a blueprint for global war. I'm wondering if you've had a chance to read in what your reaction is. And also um, if you wanted to say anything about NATO and uh, uh, NATO in Africa and the case of Libya in 2011. Thanks. All right. Well, I did. I did read, uh, you know, an, an overview of that uh, declaration, and it's a warmongering, you know, offensive, militaristic declaration. It's a declaration of World War III, and people should be aware of that. Our country is driving World War III. And if if it if we allow it to continue, I I, I, I can't see how it won't go nuclear. Uh, and we you know we're just not going to have a future on this planet. Um, what was what was your other question? I'm sorry, I forgot. You're muted. You're muted. Oh, that's my fault. You have to uh, unmute yourself. There you go. Just, just about NATO in Africa and the case oh, of Libya yeah. in 2011. Yeah. Well, you know, NATO has been, uh, I remember, I don't know, 20 years ago, I was watching C-SPAN one day and there was a press conference and it was a U.S. military officer. He was a National Guard guy and he had a map of Africa and he had it broken up into various countries where he said, we are assigning our 50 state national guards, each to a different African country. And we are building lily pad bases in each of these African countries where these 50 national guards will be. And lily pad bases meant jumping off from one place to the other in a quick, you know, put down any opposition to US control, et cetera, et cetera. Thank God, lately, Africa is really in revolt against France, against the United States. And uh, you know who they've called to help them is Russia and China. And because they say that during the 60s and 70s, during the anti-colonial times, when the first kind of uh, anti-colonial movements began in Africa, uh, it was Russia and China who came to their aid and uh, gave them all kinds of support. Russia is now giving free grain to several African countries that can't afford to buy it, you know, because their people are hungry. So uh, that's who they're calling on to help them. And they, they view the U.S. as an enemy and the West uh, and NATO and, and the EU. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You're a great activist, by the way, Tamara. She's a great activist in Canada and around the world. Great. Um, like the, we got 9.22 and it's been so almost an hour and a half, maybe just a couple more questions and then we'll call it quits. And uh, Simri, you want to, Simri Gomery, I'm thinking that's the way it's pronounced. Go ahead. You're muted, Simri. Still muted. There you go. 
muted again. It'll give you a prompt, and then you can. There you uh, go. Okay, I was trying to do it myself. Doesn't work. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm just finding the whole thing very strange. The more I think about it, because first of all, your analogy about colonialism, like colonialism, imperialism, is usually you know white supremacist, uh, like the UK colonizing brown people all over the world and taking their resources. So the idea of NATO being a colonial force, it's all white supremacists joining together. So it's more like a neo-Nazi club than a colonizing entity. But anyway, I digress. I don't understand why they do that. Like, I don't understand why any person in their right mind would want to be part of an arms cabal that's going to destroy the world and kill us all. Like, what, how could there be like when you talk about, you know, Israel, you could say there's a kind of societal, societal, societal mental illness happening like a group insanity. But how could you apply that to the whole world? Are all our leaders crazy? Because why are they doing this? Why would anyone in their right mind want to be part of that? Why wouldn't why wouldn't Trudeau, for example, just say, I don't want to be part of NATO. We don't want to pay 2% as uh, $57 billion of our our hard-earned tax money to an arms cabal. Why don't we get out? I mean, why is what is what are they what does the US have over the whole world that they can hold them? Like if the US is so reviled and hated by so many people in so many places, how come they have all these people in their arms club? Like, how did it happen? Why does it continue? I still don't understand, even though I haven't read as many books as you have, Bruce. Maybe if I read all those books, I'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> well. I think it's fairly simple. My friends in Finland and Sweden, and I've been to both places and I have friends there, so I'm in regular contact with them. They say there was no election, no referendum about joining NATO. The people of the country were not given any chance to say anything about it. The polls were showing that people weren't very excited about this idea of joining NATO. But because their leaders, are corrupted, are brought into the U.S. system, they're trained by the U.S., and their media, Western media, corporate-dominated media, just like our mainstream media here, is run by the corporations, Washington Post, New York Times, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same in Europe. They're run by corporations. They're owned by corporations. And it's non-stop, anti-Russia, all the time. So you take that, the media, you know, concentration of people's minds, and then corrupt leadership with the, uh, people like Brzezinski's son in Sweden has been working with for years to sort out, oh, th this guy's no good. We don't want him. We, yeah, you come over here. You'll, we'll, we'll make you prime minister, that kind of thing. The, that's the kind of power the U.S. has across Europe. And, and so what do you get? You get countries that are no longer democratic, just like America is no longer democratic, although they use the language all the time. They tell everybody they are, oh, we're the greatest, we're the greatest. But it's it's all a lie. So it's to me, it's fairly simple. And it's like a playbook. You know, it's, you know, uh, what do they say? Oh, when I was a kid, you know, I wanted to be a, my mom was Italian. So I was always embarrassed how Italians were always identified as being mafia people. You know, people made fun of Italians all the time. You're just a bunch of mafia people. So I wanted to be an FBI agent. I wanted to fight organized crime. So I sent away for a, a, uh, a, 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 a course, you know, through, through the mail to get a head start on being an FBI agent. And, I, and they sent me a book of definitions. And one of the definitions I learned was modus operandi. Every criminal has an MO, a modus operandi, a way of repeating their bad behavior. And that really does it for me. The US has an MO and it works and they keep repeating it over and over and over again. And it's that simple. We just have to be able to see it. We are blinded too by uh, our own fealty to this system that we live in, even though we say we're progressive or we're radical or we don't like our government and everything else, we fall in line more than we realize we do because the MO is big time strong. I hope that helps. Good, thanks. Um, 
How about we have two more people raising their hand here? Can we take, Bruce, do you feel okay about taking two questions before you answer? Yeah, sure. let's go till midnight. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's take uh, Andrew and it's Joanne. Let's take Andrew first and, uh, you know, ask Bruce the question, and then we'll go to Joanne, get a question from you, and then, Bruce, you can answer them both. All right. All right. Andrew? You can go ahead, Andrew. You should be unmuted. Hmm. We may try going to Joanne first. Yeah, let's go to Joanne. Go ahead, Joanne. Um, okay. Um, I don't know where I can find um, people that have an interest because I don't understand why voters think they're limited and lock themselves into two choices, Trump or Biden. Um, there's other Green Party and I think um, independent voters that want democracy and invest in our economy. And if there's any platform that can be used to organize so voters know which third party is, um, you know, will be the strongest candidate. Um, I just don't understand how people lock themselves in. Okay. We're going to take another question. Is that what? Well, the other person wasn't there, Bruce. So oh. go ahead. That's, All right. I think that's your last question. Well, in my state of Maine, where I live, independents are the majority, are the largest party, if you will, larger than the Republicans and Democrats. And I believe it's that way across the country, too. But the biggest voting bloc in America are people who don't vote. And they say that, why should I bother voting? because the choices we get are you know, BS and nothing ever changes. Well, as an organizer, my job is to convince those people that they should register to vote and they should vote. But you know what? It's kind of hard to argue with the truth. You know, These people are not stupid. They know, they've clearly identified what's going on. And it's rather difficult to talk them out of that. It's good though, that we have some choices like Jill Stein running for president as a green. And uh, so you know, I'm, I'm gonna vote for Jill Stein and I, I don't see any, any way around it. But I, I also think that we don't do enough street protest. And I'm talking about small stuff. Now, my friend Sung Hee from South Korea was on this uh, call. I don't know if she still is, but in South Korea, they revere what they call the one person protest. It's very usual very common for one person to go stand by, th by themselves with a sign for sometimes hours at a time. And people really respect that. Well, in my town of Brunswick today, five of us were on the street holding signs about uh, Gaza and Palestine and genocide. My sign says, war hawks out of DC, out of Washington. And we've been going every week every Thursday since February of 2022. It started no war with Russia at that time, and it's moved in now into Gaza and Palestine. On Friday, we hold another protest uh, on the street. Uh, so uh, I think more of us should get out on the street and have communion, if you will, communication uh, with our fellow citizens. Look them in the eyeballs because a lot of people agree with us. They are just so dispirited that they don't believe anything's gonna change. And they also, a lot of them think I'm the only one that thinks this way. But when they are driving along the road and they see us out there, then they think, well, you know what? Maybe I can say something at work. Maybe I can say something at this Sunday dinner party. You know, maybe I can say something to my family about how I feel about this stuff, because look at those people are there on the street holding signs. I think more of us should do that. And it doesn't take 100,000 people to do it. We can do that even if it's just one of us. So uh, I think that we all have to step it up right now because we are in a hell of a mess. Thank you. Yeah. Good, good luck to you there, Joanne. Thank you, Bruce. 
Um, well, that's a good place to end, I think, but um, we're all in a mess, all in a hell of a mess for true. Uh, before we get away, though, Paul Shannon has an announcement he'd like to make to all of us, and then we'll, um, we'll close off after that. So go ahead, Paul. Okay, well, thank you, Ken. Uh, don't have to tell people watching this uh, webinar how uh, dangerous this uh, expansion of I should say the over nuclearization of NATO that's taking place, how dangerous that is. And of course, many of the people on these webinars and many people connected to War Industry Resistors Network um, are working against corporations that are making nuclear weapons. Uh, I remember Jack and Felice has been doing it out in New Mexico forever, and I know there's a bunch of others. Uh, well, uh, this is a good crowd to bring this idea up that uh, in September, September 22nd to 26th, there are days of action, uh, national and international days of action uh, focused against war corporations that are involved in the production of nuclear weapons, which of course, these are the very weapons <laughs> that NATO is moving into new places, that NATO is upgrading to make them more uh, effective uh, for use in battle and all this type of thing. So we have right here in our country, of course, many of these companies, just about all of them. And uh, on September 22nd to 26th, ICANN, I can never remember what these letters actually stand. I think it's the International Committee Against Nuclear Weapons, um, that they are calling for this widespread activity uh, throughout the country against these companies making these weapons. I think we can get many, many people to agree with us that uh, nuclear war is not a great idea and that even the production of these weapons is extremely dangerous. And uh, I think it's time to mobilize that sentiment. So in our, October, in our uh, August webinar, we'll be going specifically to maybe talk about some plans about how groups connected to War Industry Resistance Network might do something together. We haven't done anything together in a long time. Uh, and this would give us a good a chance to take on a good solid project uh, and get the word out there about these uh, war contractors that are right in our communities, uh, making these weapons or planning for them or drawing up the blueprints for them or whatever. They're all around us uh, and it's time to uh, call people's attention to them. So hopefully we'll be able to put something together that we will that as we're in, as War Industry Resistance Network, we might be able to participate in these days of action, September 22nd to 26th. I just ask people to consider it right now. Think of what types of things you might be able to be involved in, and we'll try to put this together later on. Ken, Great. Ken can I say hello to a few friends that I, I, I was just looking through the participant list, and I saw some of my very old friends from Florida where I worked for many years. I want to say hello to you all. Uh, one of my dear friends from Alabama, great singer, uh, Judy, I saw your name on there. I want to say I was singing your song last night. I'm the daughter of the Red Hills of Georgia. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, and uh, Sung Hee, I see you're still there. And other other friends that I've known for a long time. I just want to say hello to you all. I love you, miss you. Thank you. Sweet. Well, Bruce, this was a powerful hour and a half. You are uh, you're great. We appreciate you a lot. Thanks for being with us. And um, we'll everyone will send the recording of this out in a follow up email, and you ought to get it in a couple of days. And uh, don't forget that we have another webinar coming up next month. So again, Bruce Gagnon, you're the greatest. Thanks a lot. You're the greatest, and, uh, <laughs> You're my brother. We'll see you all next time.